Okay, we will now continue our observational overview of active galactic nuclei. And today we are going to speak about the topic of feeding the monster. That is, how is the supermassive black hole responsible for the aging activity ultimately fed? First, I will start with some overall context. And uh, just like uh, for uh, several of the previous uh, prep talks, uh, the feeding of active galactic nuclei is a multi-scale phenomenon. Uh, gas is being brought in from at least several kiloparsec scales, and indeed may even be coming in from sort of megaparsec scales, and it has to somehow work its way down through the kiloparsec scales, down to the 10 down to the 100 parsec scales, down around the narrow line region, down to the 10 parsec scales, and then down to the obscuring torus and the accretion disk. And then it has to work its, all, work its way all the way inward down to the, ultimately, the event horizon of the supermassive black hole. And today we'll be talking about that process. How does gas start from out here and work its way in and in and in and in so that it can ultimately be accreted by the supermassive black hole. Um, <clears throat> this is an enormous topic, um, and so clearly I'm going to focus on some of the essentials. Uh, one uh, essential problem is shown from this nice cartoon here. Uh, this is the essential problem of feeding the monster. Uh, the point is that uh, gas, cold gas, that a supermassive black hole might want to accrete out in a galaxy, has much higher specific angular momentum uh, than uh, is allowed uh, for it to be able to accrete. And so uh, this diagram is showing a large angular momentum spoon and a small angular momentum mouth of a baby here in a high chair. And how does this spoon, representing again the very large amount of specific angular momentum, make its way down through that mouth. Well, it takes some some, some doing uh, to make that happen. Uh, I'm sure if any of you have uh, children, uh, you have experienced this. It, it's a challenge to get material down into a baby's mouth. And similarly, it's a challenge to get material down to a supermassive black hole so that it can ultimately be accreted. Um, now, one way just to appreciate that is just to consider, for example, the rotation curve of a galaxy. Here's the rotation curve for the Milky Way as an example. And of course, angular momentum is just R cross P. And so it's basically, you know, radius times mass times velocity. And because uh, the radius become, becomes very large out in a galaxy, and because the velocity remains fairly high, quite far out in a galaxy, the gas out here has very large specific angular momentum, many orders of magnitude uh, too large uh, to allow accretion. Now, to be a little more uh, specific about that, for uh, food particles out in a galaxy, to be able to migrate inward from the galaxy environment to the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, they have to lose quantitatively about five to six orders of specific angular momentum. Okay, orders of magnitude of a specific angular momentum. About two of those five to six orders of magnitude are lost in the accretion disk. Uh, processes such as disk winds and torques may allow some of the matter uh, to work its way inward and lose uh, that, that angular momentum. Um, but here we're going to be focusing mostly on what about the remaining three to four orders of magnitude required for, to get from the galaxy environment down anywhere close to the supermassive black hole. That's still a sort of a three to four order of magnitude type problem one has to resolve. And this here is a nice table uh, taken from the Netzer book that, that kind of summarizes this. This is the angular momentum ladder for disk-like galaxies. And again, if you're out at 5,000 parsecs, you have a few times 10 to the 29 uh, units of specific angular momentum. 
and then to work your way down to 500 parsecs or 10 parsecs or one parsec, you see you're having to go down by orders of magnitude. And then to work your way down to the immediate vicinity of the black hole, several more orders of magnitude are required. And here are physical processes, many of which we'll be discussing today, by which matter can work its way inward. You can see things uh, that are thought to be involved or things like gravitational torques from a large scale bar, gravitational torques from nested nuclear bars, uh, self-gravitational instabilities, tidal disruptions of clumps, uh, hydromagnetic disk winds, and viscous torques in an accretion disk. These are the types of relevant physical processes, many of which that we will be discussing today. Okay, now one other point, j just to make things a little more specific, is you can ask, well, how much food has to be supplied to the supermassive black hole to power a luminous, radiatively efficient AGN? Well, <coughs> that number varies because, well, AGNs, even radiatively efficient AGNs, have a wide range of luminosity. I'll show you examples of that more in just a minute. But if you work out the numbers, you have to supply between about uh, one uh, one thousandth up to about 10 solar masses per year to the supermassive black hole event horizon to be able to maintain a radiatively efficient AGN. Now, that's the mass that you're supplying to the event horizon. That's not necessarily all the mass that has to flow inward. Indeed, uh, we believe that much more cold gas must be supplied to just somewhat larger scales to the outer parts of the accretion disk in the torus, for example. And that's because um, supermassive black holes are sloppy eaters. Uh, here is a nice little schematic. Uh, again, this is a nice analogy put forward by Sarah Gallagher, where she says quasars are like the cookie monster. So, so here's the cookie monster. And again, for any of you who, who have kids, you will note that the cookie monster, when he tries to eat his cookies, well, most of the cookies don't actually make it into his mouth. And you can see that here. Most of the cookie material actually gets, gets flung away due to sloppy eating. Well, it's the same thing for these supermassive black holes. They, they are sloppy eaters. Uh, they, for example, eject large amounts of mass in winds. Uh, we talked about that in, in our entire uh, lecture on winds. And in fact, the amount of material being ejected in winds is likely often considerably larger than the amount of material that's actually being accreted by the supermassive black hole. So you have to supply this much to the supermassive black hole event horizon and likely considerably more to the torus and to the accretion disk so that some small fraction of it can survive uh, being not, it can survive, you know, the, the mass ejection that's ongoing and so on to work its way down to the event horizon. Okay, um, the final point of, of context is that as uh, usual, uh, the topic that, that we're going to be discussing today is a topic of active ongoing research. And as evidence of that, here are three conferences just held over the past couple years on well, multi-phase AGN feeding and feedback through to the many facets of fueling and feedback in jetted AGNs through to a conference that in fact is coming up uh, later this year <clears throat> on AGN feedback and star formation across cosmic scales and time. So these are examples of conferences where many exciting results on this large topic of feeding the monster uh, will be presented or have been presented. And I would refer you to the talks, many of which are publicly available, the slides at least, um, at these conferences if you'd like to learn more. Furthermore, um, there are fortunately a couple of very useful reviews, uh, quite recent, um, that are available on this topic of feeding the monster. Here are two of them, one by Storchi Bergman and Schnorr Muller, and one by Combs. And um, these cover more topics than I'm gonna be able to cover today and provide many useful references that I cannot provide here. And so I refer you to these uh, if you'd like to learn more as well. Okay, so now I wanna start by laying out some of the practical challenges involved with feeding a, a supermassive black hole aside from just the, um, you know, the angular momentum issue that we've already talked about, uh, as well as practical challenges to just studying the feeding of the supermassive black holes. Just what are the observational challenges uh, encountered when attempting to do this kind of work? The first one I've already alluded to, and that is that 
Well, AGNs span an enormous range of luminosity. Even the radiatively efficient ones um, up here span at least four to five orders of magnitude in, in luminosity from the most powerful quasars in the universe down to sort of the moderate luminosity safer galaxies. And in this regime of radiatively efficient accretion, well, the luminosity is related fairly directly to the accretion rate. And so um, this wide range of luminosity corresponds to a wide range of AGN feeding rate. And that's how you end up with numbers like, you know, the 0 0.001 to 10 solar masses per year I mentioned back here. Okay. Um, that is, again, a very wide range of corresponding to the very wide range of luminosities up here, let alone uh, talking about the low luminosity AGNs, which may have much lower accretion rates still. Um, <coughs> now, you know, this, this range, as I've already mentioned, corresponds to like a factor of 10,000 or more in MDOT, in mass accretion rate. And so to supply that wide range of M dot, well, a variety of feeding processes are likely involved. Uh, what is necessary to feed powerful quasars up here is likely um, quite different th than what is required to feed the lower luminosity AGNs, the sort of safer galaxy systems down here, you know, which can be, again, 10,000 times less luminous. Uh, th there's a, likely a wide variety of feeding processes associated with feeding, you know, 10 solar masses per year up here, ballpark, uh, relative to sort of one one thousandth of a solar mass per year down here. That's a very wide range. Likely a range of different processes are involved. Um, furthermore, <clears throat> this overall is just ex fully expected to be a messy problem. Uh, we, again, are attempting to deliver gas down to the supermassive black hole. That means gas dynamics is going to be relevant. You have to, you have to consider issues such as viscosity, turbulence, shocks, uh, thermal and gravitational instabilities. Okay. Uh, furthermore, um, you have to consider the effects of magnetic fields, which likely shape the flows of this gas in many cases. Uh, you furthermore have to consider cosmic rays being uh, generated in the environment, which uh, add pressure to the interstellar medium. You have to consider star formation. Some of this gas on its trip down to the supermassive black hole may form stars. And then those stars may provide feedback to the gas that's attempting to work its way down to the supermassive black hole. So you have to consider star gas interactions. And then uh, finally, of course, you're going to have to consider feedback by the supermassive black hole itself in the form of winds and jets. And we've had lectures entirely on winds and entirely on jets. And I refer you back to those for further relevant information, as well as, of course, uh, feedback can also arise from the radiation from the AGN itself. So these are the types of factors that make this a messy, complicated problem. And, you know, just as direct evidence of this, I refer you to the center of our own galaxy. Here is the center of our own galaxy. These are sort of 500 parsec scale images, a, a sort of ballpark number. Here are radio images of the center of our galaxy. Again, you can see it is a very complex, messy environment. There are giant molecular clouds wandering around. There are stars blowing themselves up and pushing back against the immediate gas around them. And there are several supernova remnants you can see here, the remnants of exploded stars. There are complex filamentary structures. In fact, here I'll show an image that emphasizes these, mo emphasizes these more. You can see there are these complex filamentary structures that have been shaped by magnetic fields in the center of our galaxy. Um, and so all of these processes, um, gas dynamics, Magnetic fields, I mean, there are the direct evidence of the magnetic fields likely being important, okay? Um, uh, star formation and star gas interactions. Well, here are stars blowing themselves up, pushing back against the gas, and, and, and so on. All of these factors are, are relevant to the center of our own galaxy and certainly to the centers of other galaxies as well. So this is going to be a complex problem. Um, many physical phenomena are involved acting in various complicated ways, sometimes uh, enhancing each other, sometimes acting in opposition to each other. And you have to treat all of these issues carefully uh, to be able to understand this um, feeding. Um, 
Furthermore, um, what I've been talking about here are just the relevant sort of broad physics factors that have to be considered. Um, but furthermore, we know, we know that galaxies have a wide diversity. Here are two slides showing the diversity of galaxies here versus here. There are many different types of galaxies and the type of feedback that is relevant to say an S0 galaxy or an elliptical versus the type of uh, feeding processes that are relevant to a gas-rich spiral uh, may be very different. And so you have to consider the diversity of galaxies, which will lead to likely a diversity of different feeding processes. That also makes this complex. And um, indeed, given those uh, broad considerations, if you look at the observations, which I will discuss more soon, um, well, I would say just taken broadly, the detailed observations locally, where we can study these phenomena the best, indeed support the idea that AGN feeding is a messy problem. Uh, there is large observed object-to-object -object diversity, likely due to the vicissitudes of galaxy life, due to the differences of galaxies, due to all these complex factors operating in the centers of galaxies, and so on. All of these things are relevant, and they make generalizing from small samples difficult. And for broadly useful conclusions, um, one, given all this complexity, generally must focus on results that robustly emerge from large, statistically meaningful samples. That's where I think the most productive re results can be obtained. Although, of course, detailed case studies are also very valuable, you know, acting as, um, you know, templates uh, to understand uh, the large samples better. Okay, so that's... That's um, some key points. I have, I think, two more key points for why this is a, a challenging issue to study. Uh, another point is that, of course, galaxy properties are correlated with each other. Um, one famous example of that is the star forming main sequence uh, shown here as a little schematic and then shown here more quantitatively, which of course relates uh, the number of stars forming in a galaxy at the star formation rate to the number of existing stars or the galaxy's stellar mass. And you can see these two quantities are strongly correlated. Okay, now why is that a challenge? Well, if you're looking at feeding processes and if you want to, for example, assess, well, does star formation rate have an effect upon how a supermassive black hole is fed? And let's say that you find a correlation between apparent black hole feeding rate and star formation rate. Well, given that star formation rate is correlated with stellar mass, you have to then ask the question, well, because I have found a correlation between black hole feeding and star formation rate, is it truly a correlation with star formation rate? Or could it actually be a correlation with stellar mass, which induces via the star forming main sequence and apparent secondary correlation with star formation rate. That's another challenge. Many of these uh, quantities that we're attempting to study are correlated with each other and you have to sort of unwind all of that to be able to draw reliable conclusions. Uh, that is often done with partial correlation statistical techniques or other similar techniques. Uh, these are required to determine which correlations with black hole feeding rate, black hole growth, are truly fundamental versus which ones are just secondarily induced correlations by something else that's actually more fundamental. That's another challenge, the inherent correlation of many things with many other things. And then um, finally, uh, another important challenge is that uh, the accretion onto supermassive black holes is known to be strongly variable. We expect and indeed, we know that supermassive black hole accretion will vary strongly over mega year timescales or less. As direct evidence for that, I, I point you to this plot, which I had shown earlier, um, which shows um, uh, B band magnitude versus Julian date for about 100 years uh, of data on 3C273. You can see 3C273 is varying substantially over that time. Okay. Um, furthermore, um, if you then look at numerical simulations of uh, AGN variability and how much we expect AGNs to vary over long time scales due to changes in their, their feeding rates, they're expected to vary a lot in Eddington ratio by orders of magnitude in Eddington ratio. And this can cause uh, a 
the same galaxy at some points over time containing the same AGN uh, to sometimes appear to be almost a normal galaxy when the AGN has become very faint, or alternatively, when the AGN happens due to these fluctuations to be accreting much faster to appear as a luminous AGN. And so one has to deal with this accretion variability, which can induce large scatter in correlation studies between AGN strength and galaxy properties. So now that we have uh, gotten that introductory material out of the way and we appreciate the, the challenges involved, I would now want to talk about how a supermassive black hole uh, may be able to swallow gas from a host galaxy. Okay, and so here is a useful uh, schematic from the Storchi, uh, Bergman, and Schnorr uh, Muller review that breaks down key feeding processes by their physical scale. Uh, ranging from extragalactic scales out here involving things like mergers of galaxies and so on down to galactic scales of sort of 1 to 10 kiloparsecs where things like bars and spiral arms are likely involved and then down to sort of the inner kiloparsec where nuclear bars, nuclear spirals and other processes are likely involved. Uh, for now, I am going to focus on the galactic scales and the inner kiloparsec and then we will talk about extragalactic scales a little bit later. So again, let's talk about swallowing gas from a host galaxy down at galactic and smaller scales. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, it's useful when thinking about this problem to consider the relevant time scales involved. Um, first, uh, if, you can, if we look at the characteristic required growth time for a supermassive black hole to grow, its uptime as an AGN may well last only about 100 to 300 mega years or so, and could be even shorter than that. There are many arguments for this uh, coming from um, AGN evolution considerations and so on. I refer you to this review by Martini in 2003, as well as more recent papers that often cite this review uh, for um, these types of constraints. Um, but that's the characteristic uptime that a supermassive black hole likely has as a AGN. Well, for comparison, the typical orbital time scale at say one kiloparsec is 30 mega years. And you know, if you go out further in a galaxy, well, of course the sun's orbital time scale around the center of our galaxy is about 230 mega years, which of course, especially that number is quite comparable to the total uptime that a supermassive black hole may have as an AGN. And so what this is telling you is that much supermassive black hole growth must occur in just a few galaxy dynamical times. And that implies that efficient <coughs> kiloparsec scale mechanisms are going to be required to transport cold gas inward on this kind of a time scale. Okay, you need efficient processes operating on large scales to transport a galaxy's gas down close to the black hole to allow it to accrete. Um, now, <coughs> at kiloparsec scales, the cold gas density is small, and thus viscous torques are generally too small for effective feeding. That's not going to be the mechanism, viscosity, by which you're going to be able to transport this material inward. Instead, uh, gravitational torques are uh, likely required um, for effective inward gas transport. These gravitational torques that are capable of providing significant inward gas transport generally require non-axisymmetric disturbances of a galaxy, phenomena such as bars and spirals. And so here are <coughs> a, a, some nice examples of barred uh, galaxies, barred spirals, and um, here you can see the beautiful spiral arms and the prominent bar here. Here's a number of other examples where you can see bars in these galaxies, okay? Um, and there's a variety of different types of bars, as you can see, in terms of bar strength and so on. But these bars are not just sort of pretty to look at, and they are very pretty to look at in many cases, but they're thought to be critical for inward transport of uh, gas. Okay, now let's say a little bit about that inward gas transport. Well, <coughs> galaxy disks at kiloparsec scales 
are unstable to bar and spiral formation. This is a complex uh, topic emerging from you know studies of galaxy dynamics. I refer you to chapter six of Binney and Tremaine's book um, for a useful discussion of, of that topic. I'm not going to go through all the detailed calculations of bar and spiral formation um, in this uh, lecture. Indeed, you could have an entire lecture or indeed an entire course uh, just on that topic. Um, <clears throat> just to give a few essentials, though, you know, bars and spirals are density waves uh, constituting immaterial patterns in a galaxy where the stars and the gas rotate at different speeds. Um, and dynamical modeling shows that the primary bar, so this these large scale bars here shown in these diagrams, okay, can generate the needed gravitational torques to transport cold gas inward to around the inner Lindblad radius. Um, and at that, excuse me, inner Lindblad resonance. And at about that radius, um, a circumnuclear ring may form and be apparent. And indeed, given that this is an observational course, I now wanna show you some observations of these circumnuclear rings. Here is a nice, uh, a nice, a nice image, in this case from the Hubble Space Telescope, of a beautiful active galaxy, uh, NGC 1672. <clears throat> it's a very spectacular galaxy uh, in the southern sky. And um, if you look at th this uh, galaxy in the near and mid infrared, as, as now can be done with the James Webb Space Telescope, you see an image that looks like this. So this is, again, JWST, near infrared and mid infrared imaging that emphasizes effectively the gas and the dust. And indeed, you can see along the spiral arms and the bar of this galaxy, gas seems to be working its way in toward the nuclear region and is piling up to form a circumnuclear ring, which you can see right there. Okay, that's, so that's what people are referring to when they talk about these circumnuclear rings. Here's another spectacular example. This is NGC 1512, and look at that spectacular ring in there. And indeed, people have now uh, found uh, these rings with a variety of different techniques, ranging from radio imaging to uh, submillimeter imaging of molecules through to infrared imaging and so on. Um, they have found these circumnuclear rings in many other galaxies as well. In fact, here is a nice compilation, this paper by Comeron et al., of um, circumnuclear rings. <clears throat> in each one of these, you have a large-scale image of a galaxy, and then you zoom in on the circumnuclear ring region so you can see the ring there and there and there and there and there and there. And here are more beautiful examples Here's a beautiful ring. There's a very nice ring there. There's one there and there. Here are more, okay, in each one of these cases. And in fact, in this paper, they in fact give a compilation of 113 uh, nuclear rings. Um, and, and this is all part of a project called the Atlas of Images of Nuclear Rings, or ANER, which is a very nice name um, for a project th th that is studying rings, of course. And um, here is a plot that basically shows the ring radius in parsecs versus uh, distance, uh, I believe, to the galaxy in, in megaparsecs. And you can see the ring radius is, uh, can be fairly large, can go up to sort of two kiloparsecs or so, um, and, and goes down to sort of 150 to 100 uh, parsecs or so. So it's, you know, these nuclear rings have a range of different physical sizes. Um, but but that, those are the general sizes that are found. Now let's put that in context with the various AGN structures uh, that we've talked about. Well, sort of this, this sort of range, let's take the typical value to be, you know, several hundred parsecs, okay? Um, that sort of radius um, is um, well within the narrow line region. This is uh, the plot uh, that I showed you in an earlier lecture, the lecture on the narrow line region that shows the NLR line luminosity versus radius for the different famous, well-studied narrow line region lines. And again, these nuclear rings out at several hundred parsecs are well within the narrow line region, okay? And indeed, the ionized surface of some of these circumnuclear rings may indeed make, at least in some cases, some 
of that narrow line region emission. Okay, so that's the sort of size scale. We're talking now of material that has been transported inward by a, um, by a large scale galactic bar down to sort of the size of the narrow line region. Now, if we sort of consider even smaller scale uh, AGN structures, of course, the next perhaps scale to consider is the scale of the torus. And as we've learned in our lecture on, on the torus, the torus is a complex object likely consisting of a clumpy disk and a clumpy wind shown by this schematic here. Um, but the torus, uh, and especially the, the sort of clumpy disk component of the torus, what is typically been thought of as the torus, the donut, um, that component still lies well within the nuclear ring. Remember the characteristic size scales uh, of these tori, uh, the, the clumpy disk component can go out to tens of parsecs. Here is the NGC 1068, and here is its um, clumpy disk component going out to, you know, of order 10, 20 parsecs or so. Um, and then, of course, the, the clumpy wind can go out even larger. It can go out to sort of 100 to 200 parsec scale. So that's getting, so it's not not small compared to the nuclear rings, but even for that, generally these, these structures would be lying inside the nuclear rings. And thus, further inward gas transport from the nuclear ring, deeper down through the narrow line region, down to at least the tourist region is going to be important. And so how do you get that further inward gas transport? Well, <coughs> further inward transport of cold gas beyond the sort of one to two, 100 to 2,000 parsec scale of the circumnuclear rings often relies upon the formation of a smaller so-called nuclear bar. Um, this becomes possible when sufficient gas accumulates, and this nuclear bar is a distinct structure from the primary bar of the galaxy, being of course much smaller and rotating with a faster pattern speed. Uh, so here, in fact, is a classic paper discussing this idea of bars within bars as a mechanism for fueling active galactic nuclei. And just taking right from the abstract of this paper, they, they talk about how on the large scale, a stellar bar sweeps the interstellar medium into a gaseous disk of a few hundred parsecs in radius. And then under certain conditions, once sufficient gas has accumulated, um, this disk can become unstable again, allowing material to flow further inward until turbulent viscous processes control angular momentum transport, and that lets the material work its way all the way in. So you have smaller scale bars, uh, nuclear bars is what they're often referred to as, that are responsible for getting the material further in closer to the AGN. Um, this works down to scales of order sort of 10 parsecs or so, at that point, the gravitational potential becomes dominated by the supermassive black hole, and then bar-like modes uh, are no longer expected to be present, and other cascading modes, such as lopsided waves and so on, are thought to be associated with transporting the gas further inward. And indeed, this has become a topic of large-scale numerical simulation in recent years, here is, you know, one a nice example by Angeles Alcazar et al., um, <clears throat> where they here are simulating, in this case, the gas mass uh, surface density from sort of megaparsec scales down to 100 kiloparsecs, 10 kiloparsecs, 1 kiloparsec, uh, 100 parsecs, and here's 10 parsec scale for, for that box. And they have simulated the gas transport processes all the way down to these very small scales where you're get, now getting down to the, the torus scale. And I refer you to papers such as this one for, for further, uh, further discussion. Here is another uh, very uh, relevant such paper that, that talks about, um, again, this further inward gas transport problem using simulations. This is a somewhat older paper. Um, where, where here this bar is now 500 parsecs. And in this case, what they're doing is they are simulating um, different systems that have a different contributions of bulge components, where more bulge component goes toward the top of the diagram. All the details are down here in the caption. I believe they go up to sort of 80% bulge, uh, yeah, bulge compared to total. Um, up here, and then along, oh no, that's, that's the gas component, sorry, the bulge component, it goes up to B over T is 0.8. And then here is the gas component, 
um, and more gas goes in this direction, where again, this is the, the gas, the mass of the gas divided by the total mass. And basically, you can see that for different parameter choices of the amount of bulge component that's relevant, the amount of gas that's present, you can get a variety of different transport modes being responsible for funneling the material down to these small scales. Okay, so that's the sort of theoretical calculations and the theoretical expectations about these nuclear bars, but, but do we see them? And, and the answer is yes, these have been now seen and studied in some detail and much further work is ongoing. Um, here, here is just one nice example. Here is uh, observations of here they refer to the inner bar, which would be the same as that nuclear bar, where here they show you know a large scale image of a galaxy. Then here they show from Hubble Space Telescope imaging, uh, you know sharp imaging of the nuclear region. Here is an inner bar structure, and here is the structure revealed in an unsharp mask image. Here is a nuclear ring uh, shown in this particular one. And here's another nice example where, again, in these isophotes, you can see it, an inner bar and a stellar nuclear ring, you know, in this case. And they, they are revealed very nicely in this unsharp masked image here. So um, these are examples of direct imaging of these inner bars or nuclear bars. Um, this has also been done in um, molecular gas uh, imaging. In this case, I believe these are ALMA observations with carbon monoxide, uh, 3-2, and, and here you can see small scale nuclear spirals uh, being present in the molecular gas that is uh, very likely, according to their calculations based upon these data, uh, responsible for funneling significant amounts of material down to the nuclear region. So there are observations of these phenomena. Many more of these are ongoing with um, James Webb Space Telescope, now with uh, ALMA in molecular observations and so on. And um, then once the material has worked its way inward through the main bar and then through the nuclear bar and then through a variety of other cascading modes, uh, well, eventually that material reaches the torus and the accretion disk. And then what happens? Well, then in a rather ungrateful manner, uh, the little child, that is the supermassive black hole, um, spits most of its food back out. Okay, it, it, It's not very grateful for the efforts of all of these nuclear bars and large scale bars and cascading modes and all this stuff. In fact, it spits most of the material that is fed to these small scales back out via winds and jets. But some fraction of the material does make it down to the supermassive black hole. And that's the material that ultimately feeds the monster and allows the supermassive black hole to grow further. Okay, and again, you can learn more about that in the lectures that I have on um, you know, winds and jets uh, that discusses some of those topics, as well as some of the review articles that I've mentioned previously. Okay, um, <clears throat> the final thing I will just say about these bars for now is it's also, of course, of interest to look at how common these bars are over cosmic time. Um, this is a, a challenging thing to do. You generally want to go out as far as you can into the infrared uh, to do this. And um, it appears that bars um, become more common over cosmic time. Here is one example of that showing a variety of different studies. But it, it, and broadly, it appears that the bar fraction rises over cosmic time. Uh, you know, indicative of galaxy disks becoming sufficiently dynamically mature uh, to be able to form these structures. And of course, this has implications for supermassive black hole feeding at high redshift. You know, if there aren't many bars at high redshift, one would want to consider other modes of feeding. And we'll talk about some of that uh, later on. Um, I will also mention this is a complex topic. The bar fraction likely has additionally a galaxy mass dependence, and you can read this paper and other relevant papers for discussions of these topics. But it appears that the bar frequency generally rises over cosmic time. Okay, um, so we've now talked about feeding a supermassive black hole with cold gas. Uh, of course, there's another potential source of food as well, and that is the stars in the galaxy. So now we will talk about whether the swallowing of stars from a host galaxy could make a significant contribution to supermassive black hole growth. 
Um, and so let, let's go back here to our AGN powers of 10. And remember in, in these nice plots that again, Pat Hall originally made, you can see the various stars and where they are expected to lie in the nuclear region. Obviously, we don't think they're in a rectangular grid like this, but this just shows character, the characteristic sort of separation of stars and how many stars you might expect there to be on physical scales of the broadline region, where there are non-negligible number of stars in there, as well as then on scales you know, somewhat larger, where you um, are thinking of the outflowing wind and the inner edge of the narrow line region and so on. Okay, and um, there are substantial stars expected to be there, and that, of course, is because the nuclear star cluster is dense in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. The, the, the density of stars typically rises following a power law uh, component, and um, <clears throat> this, of course, is thought to be the case. This, this dense nuclear star star cluster is thought to be the case, of course, both for active galactic nuclei and for normal non-EGN galaxies as well. And the idea is that in these systems, well, star-star scattering will, from time to time, perturb the motions of these stars so that stars will occasionally enter orbits with sufficiently low angular momentum that they can pass at uh, para, para, parabothron or whatever it's referred to as. They can pass within the tidal disruption radius of the supermassive black hole. They pass close to the supermassive black hole and then are tidally torn apart. Now, this is an active topic of research of, of tidal disruption events. I'm not going to go through it in full detail. It'll become apparent why in, in just a couple of slides. But, but very briefly, um, the idea then is once a star is scattered to where it passes sufficiently close to the supermassive black hole, um, it can be tidally torn apart. As it passes close to the supermassive black hole, the star is stretched out and, and is then torn apart and is reduced to its constituent gas, some of which is tossed out from the system and some of which remains bound to the supermassive black hole and is ultimately accreted. Okay. Um, and this mass, as it's accreted, can turn a normal galaxy, and of course because normal galaxies are more common than AGNs, we expect most of these tidal disruptions to happen in normal galaxies, uh, these are generally expected to turn a normal galaxy into a temporary active galactic nucleus for a period of months to years. That's, you know, the amount of mass in the star can feed one of these supermassive black holes for around that sort of time scale. Um, there are a number of other complexities associated with this feeding process. This is a useful diagram here that shows the Schwarzschild radius compared to the tidal disruption radius, which scales like, like this. And um, note one interesting point is that uh, above sufficiently high masses, about 3 times 10 to the 8 solar masses for the supermassive black hole, um, there, the tidal disruption radius is smaller than the Schwarzschild radius. So at that point, tidal disruptions will not occur. And in fact, stars will be swallowed whole by the supermassive black hole up there. The tidal, tidal forces never get strong enough to tear apart a star before it is actually within the event horizon. So up here at these very large masses, stars can just be swallowed whole without these disruption events at all. Um, now, again, this is a whole topic of study. Um, these tidal disruption events are now regularly found in wide field optical ultraviolet and x-ray surveys. And here are just a couple of nice examples of light curves of these tidal disruption events. Um, here is one where a, an individual event is being uh, measured in multiple photometric bands. And you can see the detailed light curves they've obtained for this tidal disruption event. Uh, and then uh, here is a, a plot where they show a variety of different tidal disruption events and their characteristic light curves. Okay, uh, this is the luminosity of the black body component of the tidal disruption. And um, in addition to sort of this general sort of fast rise and then slower fall behavior, um, sometimes, for example, you can have a strong and highly variable relativistic jet that is produced. This happens of order 10% of the time. And this can affect the light curves in some of the bands, uh, particularly, for example, in the radio and the X-ray due to the jet-related emission. And again, there is now a complex phenomenology of tidal disruption 
uh, event, optical and ultraviolet spectral classes. I'm not going to go into that here. Um, instead, I want to focus on the importance of these tidal disruption events to feeding the monster, since that's the topic at issue today. And um, to do that, well, you have to have some estimate of the tidal disruption rates. And uh, these tidal disruption rates have been calculated theoretically. Here is one example of a theoretical paper that gives pretty clear you know, estimates for how often these tidal disruption events should be occurring. And then here is a uh, fairly recent paper uh, which actually looks at the tidal disruption rates. And in this paper, well, here you can see the volumetric rate of tidal disruption events per cubic megaparsec per year per dex and versus a galaxy's total stellar mass. And you can see that the rate actually drops off dramatically up at the high galaxy stellar masses. That's thought to be due to the fact that these have the very massive black holes that swallow the stars whole. Um, <clears throat> but broadly, if you look at the rates that people are finding via the optical ultraviolet and X-ray surveys, you know the ballpark number is that you get about one tidal disruption event per galaxy excuse me, about one times 10 to the minus four. So about one tidal disruption event every 10,000 years per galaxy. That's the sort of typical rate. Um, <clears throat> and then you can ask, well, then what does that tell us about supermassive black hole feeding? Well, um, if you, you can do this with a brief calculation. Um, so if you take the, these rates, which again are about 10 to the minus four per galaxy per year, and if you multiply it by the characteristic lifetime of a galaxy of order 10 to the 10 years with that kind of a rate, and if you're feeding out typically about a one solar mass star, uh, then you expect there to be of order 10 to the 6 solar masses accreted over a galaxy's lifetime. Uh, and this, this sort of estimate, while it's very basic, seems to actually be not too bad. Uh, Magori and Tremaine uh, provide a more sophisticated calculation of this type of a matter and, and give further justification, but end up with a rather similar number to what I'm talking about here. And so this 10 to the 6 solar masses is nice. Uh, and of course, these tidal disruption events produce remarkable pyrotechnics. But this sort of a, a number derived from the best available data uh, indicates that um, these tidal disruption events only contribute a small fraction of the overall supermassive black hole growth in the universe. Um, and that could be appreciated by looking at this plot, which kind of shows the mass weighted uh, black hole mass distribution. And most of the supermassive black hole mass is up around 10 to the 8, several 10 to the 8, up to 10 to the 9 or so solar masses. That's where all the black hole mass is. Okay. And we're talking about adding 10 to the 6 solar masses worth of mass from these tidal disruption events to that. And that's a small perturbation upon the typical black holes where most of the black hole masses. And this is indicating that um, tidal disruption events are really unlikely to be very important for black hole feeding overall. Um, and so again, you end up with um, remarkable pyrotechnics, but only a small contribution to overall supermassive black hole growth in the universe, kind of like Act 5, Scene 5 of Macbeth, where they talk about much sound and fury signifying nothing. It's that, that same type of issue here. Um, although the, the one point, the one sort of uh, addendum to that is that um, tidal disruption events may make a large fractional contribution to the growth of the sort of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes in dwarf galaxies, which are very interesting systems, although they make up only a tiny fraction of the overall supermassive black hole growth. Um, <clears throat> even here, however, their importance is uncertain. Um, and for discussion of that, you can see uh, papers such as these down here, uh, which argue some of them that... Uh, the tidal disruption events may have a large contribution fractionally to the generation of uh, black holes and dwarf galaxies, as well as recent observational results suggesting that the contribution may not be that large. And so this is still a, a, a debated issue, and their overall importance is uncertain, and this is still a topic of active research. Okay, so the end conclusion is that these tidal disruption events are remarkable, they're a lot of fun to study, 
uh, they give you lots of interesting pyrotechnics and so on, but they don't matter that much for overall supermassive black hole growth in the universe unless we're really missing something in our understanding. Um, now, <coughs> I do want to mention that there are other kind of related stellar feeding phenomena as well. Uh, for example, tidal stripping uh, may occur uh, when a star passes close to a supermassive black hole, but not so close to be disrupted. And if that star, for example, is undergoing stellar evolution, then over time, as the star evolves, it can spoon feed little drag dribbles of mass to a supermassive black hole. Uh, there indeed are theoretical papers discussing those types of ideas. And um, this may lead to, for example, episodic flaring on the orbital time scale of the star around the black hole. And this is perhaps related to some X-ray quasi-periodic eruptions that I talked about earlier on in the uh, lecture on the black hole region. So there may be interesting phenomena associated with that. But again, that's not thought to be a major mode of black hole growth, a major mode of feeding the monster. Um, similarly, you can have collisions between the densely packed stars in the nuclear star cluster. These can tear off significant mass because these stars are moving very fast, close to the black hole at relativistic speeds. A indeed, you can even destroy stars entirely via these collisions, and this can help to feed supermassive black holes. But again, this is not thought to be a major mode of feeding. Again, unless we're missing something in our understanding. A and then finally, well, interacting stellar winds may also, in some cases, provide sufficient mass to power very low level accretion. That's also of interest. So there are various stellar feeding phenomena, but add it all up, uh, they don't seem to make a large contribution to overall supermassive black hole growth in the universe. Okay, now I want to go back to a topic that I had promised to cover earlier and have not yet done, and, and that is I'd like to discuss enhanced feeding via galaxy interactions and mergers. Um, we went, we, I showed you this diagram earlier on we, we, where we focused so far on galaxy scales and the inner kiloparsec scales. And, and now I want to say some words about extragalactic scales and the feeding of supermassive black holes via major mergers and minor mergers and harassment and other phenomena. Okay, um, <clears throat> so... Galaxy interactions and mergers can enhance the flow of cold gas to a supermassive black hole. Uh, this is possible essentially because the total gravitational potential in a galaxy interaction or merger becomes strongly non-axisymmetric, leading to strong torques being exerted upon a galaxy. And the, the resulting tidal forces can lead to strong bar formation and the, the rapid driving of gas toward the center. Um, just to appreciate this, this total gravitational potential being strongly non-axisymmetric, you can just look at you know, images of galaxy-galaxy interactions. Here's a nice one here where these galaxies are yanking upon each other in pretty clearly a non-axisymmetric way. Um, here are many other beautiful examples image with the Hubble Space Telescope of galaxy-galaxy interactions Okay, and how they produce, again, strongly non-axisymmetric potentials capable of driving the formation of bars and the funneling of matter down close to the supermassive black hole. Um, in fact, uh, these major mergers have been argued to be, and likely are, an essential mode of rapid feeding of the rare, most luminous quasars in the universe. And less uh, major mergers or minor mergers are likely an additional important mode of feeding, as we will see. Um, <clears throat> now, as all of this mass, this cold, dusty gas, is driven down to the vicinity of the supermassive black hole, well, it will, of course, obscure much of the stellar and supermassive black hole emissions um, that try to emerge from that region, and uh, furthermore, um, as large amounts of dusty gas is pushed into the nuclear region, you likely are expected to set off strong nuclear star formation that will accompany the rapid feeding. And so these are relevant, oper um, relevant factors operating as well as this strong uh, black hole growth is occurring. Now I have here a, a useful, often cited uh, schematic 
that discusses this overall topic. Here, this basically is a schematic showing as, as a set of panels, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, um, the, the, the sort of development of one of these mergers. And here is uh, plots uh, in the middle showing uh, the star formation rate and the quasar luminosity as a function of time relative to the merger time, which is set there to be time of zero. And A, B, C, D here, you know, the, these letters here correspond to the various panels. So you start off with an isolated disk galaxy. Uh, its halo then it creates similar mass companions. Uh, within one of these halos, the galaxies can interact, lose angular momentum, and then ultimately coalesce. And this is uh, the point where you have large feeding of cold gas down to the nuclear regions, along with associated obscuration, as well as likely strong star formation. And, you know, these systems are often thought, referred to as sort of buried AGNs or obscured quasars or dust obscured galaxies. These are the, the types of systems uh, that are commonly thought to be associated with this physical stage. Um, then um, as this uh, progresses, as the black hole growth progresses, again, being driven by all of this um, strong uh, feeding, um, well, eventually, the, the, the supermassive black hole grows to a sufficient mass where it can provide substantial feedback to its environment. It then blows out the material around it, and the, the system may be significantly reddened for a while, but is no longer as severely obscured as it was back here, and then may will ultimately emerge as a sort of typical optically selected quasar. And then ultimately, then the feedback continues to operate. It ejects sufficient material, for, at least from the vicinity of the black hole and likely from the entire galaxy, that the system decays away uh, and becomes ultimately likely a dead elliptical galaxy. So that's the overall broad sequence um, sort of sketched out as a schematic. There likely are, of course, strong deviations and variations from system to system, but this is the overall broad picture of how things are thought to play out. Now then, of course, this being an observational course, you know, what is the observational evidence for this? Well, there are many studies now looking at the um, properties of galaxies and looking to see if uh, mergers are found uh, preferentially among active galaxies compared to matched non-active galaxies and so on. And there's a large literature that has, and, and the, the researchers have found a variety of conclusions. I refer you to the reviews for citations of, of much of that literature. I'm just going to show a couple of recent examples. Here is um, <clears throat> one recent sort of large statistical sample and in this case, <clears throat> they are plotting essentially the AGN fraction as a function of stellar mass for non-interacting galaxies. And these have been derived from careful analyses of the imaging, non-interacting galaxies, and then uh, major mergers as the purple, and then all mergers as the kind of red. And you can see um, at different redshifts, in this case going up to redshifts of 0.9, uh, there is a quite clear enhancement um, such that galaxies undergoing mergers are more likely to contain luminous obscured AGNs, okay? Um, you can see that here. The AGN fraction is much higher among the merger systems, okay, than it is among the non-interacting systems. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, you know, this is a busy plot with many things going on. You can you can read that you can pause the video and read the caption and puzzle it all out if you want. But but essentially these residuals here are also used to show that if you look at the most luminous AGN systems, they systematically reside in merging systems even more than the lower luminosity systems do. That's what this sort of breaking apart of these residuals here are showing. And um, so that's another fact emerging from this. And all of this is in pretty good qualitative agreement with the broad expectations from a picture like this. Galaxies undergoing mergers are more likely con to contain luminous obscured AGNs, just like you would expect here. 
and the most luminous AGN systematically reside in emerging systems, also what you might physically expect broadly from a picture like this. And anyway, I refer you to this paper and many other papers for detailed technical analyses of these points. Here is one more nice recent paper on this topic. In, in this case, the authors are looking at powerful radio loud AGNs, powerful radio loud quasars, and uh, they compare the merger fraction for powerful radio loud quasars to various other AGN samples, in this case of radio quiet systems. And they find the radio loud systems are very preferentially found in merger systems such that the sort of merger fraction here is like 87%, okay, um, for the merger fractions there. And, and then for these other samples, it's more like 30, 45% or so. So again, for the radio loud, powerful radio loud AGNs, there appears to be a very high merger fraction indeed, at least from this work. And again, there's a, there's a wide variety of literature now observationally looking into this issue. People find a variety of results by and large at least for the highly luminous AGNs, it certainly appears that um, mergers and interactions have a significant role in triggering those very powerful AGN systems. Um, this, I mean, broadly speaking, uh, this sort of merger-driven uh, uh, model has had some significant successes um, when applied to, again, the rare luminous quasars. Uh, probably is not as relevant for the lower luminosity AGN systems where secular processes can often lead to feeding. But, but some of the broad successes are that, um, well, this major merger-based model can fit the quasar luminosity function. Now, it has a lot of parameters to tweak, but it can fit the quasar luminosity function, which is good. Um, it can also help to explain the broad cosmic downsizing of the AGN population. I'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Um, it also helps to explain supermassive black hole growth versus star formation connections. We'll talk more about that soon. And, and then finally, it also helps to explain the, the nature and the origin of the highly obscured luminous quasar systems. And those are some significant successes for this broad picture. Much work is still being done to develop this picture, to gather further observations, to test these points. But by and large, it's been a success. So then I would like to end uh, today by talking about another way to address this whole topic of feeding the monster. And that is I'd like to talk about the galactic correlates of supermassive black hole growth as uh, deduced from large survey-based samples. Uh, this is a, a topic, again, of ongoing research. Uh, there are a number of uh, reviews uh, summarizing uh, this topic. And again, these cover more topics and provide many references that I cannot provide here while I'll just, again, skim the surface and, and speak of some of the essentials. But um, this overall approach here is has proved to be a very important one because as I've said, um, this whole process of feeding the monster is a complex and messy one. And so the best way to get reliable insights about it, I believe, is to look at large samples generally derived from one type of survey or another and to then utilize robust statistical techniques uh, to uh, deduce what correlations are present in the data and are truly robust and, and that, that stand out even given all the scatter due to the complexity. And that lets you infer what really matters for driving supermassive black hole growth. Okay, so <clears throat> to start with, I just want to say a few words about uh, relevant the relevant surveys. There are many surveys that can be used productively uh, for th this kind of an approach. Um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for example, has been very effective at studying um, black hole feeding uh, and with, uh, in this case, using generally spectroscopy. Uh, Sloan has now uh, obtained spectra for something like three plus million galaxies, something like 750 plus thousand quasars. And there are many more AGNs that can be ferreted out at lower luminosities utilizing BPT diagrams and so on, as I discussed in the lecture on the narrow line region. 
and uh, Sloan has been used, you know, in general, most effectively in the relatively low redshift universe to look at indicators um, of supermassive black hole growth. And again, what properties of a galaxy cause it to generate a supermassive black hole? Um, <coughs> additionally, um, leading multi-wavelength survey fields are very powerful in this endeavor as well. Here is a summary of very well studied multi-wavelength survey fields, some of them. There are several others as well, ranging from ultra deep surveys over very small areas to sort of medium depth, medium area surveys to now fairly wide area surveys. And these range from a small fraction of a degree up to about 60 square degrees now. They have quite good depth imaging. Uh, they have excellent X-ray data, which is useful for finding AGNs and measuring accretion rates. And they have superb, in fact, characterization across the entire multi-wavelength uh, spectrum. And that's very important for measuring galaxy properties, uh, stellar masses, star formation rates, and so on. And in many cases, they even have high quality imaging with the Hubble Space Telescope, for example, that lets you perform excellent um, morphological work, uh, even out at high redshifts. And um, these surveys contain, well, obviously very large numbers of galaxies labeled here, listed here, also large numbers of AGNs. And um, with the excellent deep multi-wavelength characterization, these multi-wavelength survey fields often let you push to considerably high, higher redshifts for the same types of objects as you can study in the more local universe with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. You can perform host galaxy studies of AGNs out at, well, redshifts 2, 3, and even beyond now with the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay, um, <clears throat> so... What, what do you have to be able to measure to be able to conduct uh, th these, these studies of the galactic correlates of supermassive black hole growth? Well, you're going to have to measure some properties of galaxies. And I want to say a few words about that now. Uh, for example, things that you might uh, want to study as relation to, in relation to uh, supermassive black hole growth are, for example, galaxy stellar masses, galaxy star formation rates. Uh, these can uh, often be derived if you have high quality spectra via spectroscopy uh, and or they can be derived via fitting of spectral energy distributions. Uh, here are some examples of spectral energy distributions for a galaxy, for an AGN here, and for in this case for a bursting quenching galaxy. And note these have many photometric bands spanning all the way from the X-ray out to the far infrared, and all of these bands, including now even the X-ray, can be used in the SED fitting. Um, <clears throat> ideally then, for this SED fitting, well, again, as I said, you want high quality coverage spanning the far infrared to the X-ray bands, and you want many bands covered, sort of 10 to 40 bands are often what are used in these high quality SED fitting studies. And of course, you must also use suitable SED templates when you have AGNs present uh, to allow reliable characterization of the AGN and the galaxy in which it lives. Um, <coughs> and via much work by many, many authors, uh, these sorts of techniques via SED fitting have been advanced to where you can do quite well at measuring stellar masses and star formation rates, even for AGNs. Uh, here are plots here showing for galaxies, AGNs, and broadline AGNs. In this case, two different authors uh, attempting to work out stellar masses in the Chandra Deep Field South, an extremely well-studied survey field, and they get quite good agreement now. Um, here are star formation rates, which are more challenging, uh, but, but in this case, uh, what is being compared are star formation rates derived via the SED-based fitting approach versus, in this case, utilizing just the far infrared data, uh, which turns out to be a quite good indicator of star formation. And you get pretty good correlations there as well. So we now think that you can actually get, even for systems where, the, where AGNs are present, provided the AGNs are not too powerful, and preferably if they're obscured, so you don't have too strong um, direct AGN light in the system, you can get pretty good estimates of stellar masses and star formation rates. Furthermore, uh, you also, of course, want to be able to measure galaxy morphologies. And thankfully, um, this is often possible now from well, excellent ground-based, very wide field imaging surveys, for example, with the Subaru telescope, uh, as well as 
um, well, in the, in the survey fields, excellent Hubble Space Telescope imaging. In this case, I am showing uh, Hubble Space Telescope images of X-ray sources, many of which are AGNs, labeled as AGNs here in the upper right of each of these panels. And, and these are the red shifts in each one of these. Um, so you see that these extend out to quite high red shifts um, uh, of X-ray sources. Uh, in the Chandra Deep Field South. The, the little circle is the 68% error circle for the X-ray source. You can reliably match the X-ray source to the galaxy, and you can then see you have good morphological measurements of the galaxies, even out to moderately high redshifts that let you study galaxy morphologies. These particular images are uh, made in a combination of the B-band, the Z-band, and then out in the near infrared. And this is very important, having multi-band imaging, because you want to be able to study systems in the same rest frame band so you can intercompare things reliably at different redshifts. And that is now possible. It, is, it can be done even better now with the James Webb Space Telescope. But here, here is an example of these. And we have large samples. Here's another page like the previous one. Here's another page. Here's another page. And we have many, many such pages of large numbers of growing supermassive black holes in the distant universe with you know well-measured galaxy properties. And we can use this to piece together um, what morphological properties of a galaxy might be linked to supermassive black hole growth. Okay, so then what are the results that emerge from these systems where you have AGNs where you can measure host galaxy stellar masses and star formation rates and morphologies. What are some of the main results that emerge? Well, I'm going to summarize some of those now. Um, first of all, <coughs> the, the, the strongest thing that emerges in general is that supermassive black hole growth has a very strong dependence upon stellar mass. Stellar mass remains the strongest and most robust dependence of supermassive black hole growth uh, for the general galaxy population. And you can see that here in a local universe study. In this case, these authors, Kaufman et al., are studying 122,000, 123,000 galaxies, um, including normal galaxies as well as AGNs and some significant fraction of them. And here is a distribution of stellar mass for all the galaxies for the AGNs here, and then you can see the AGN fraction rapidly rises toward large stellar masses. And for powerful AGNs in this bottom panel, <clears throat> again, you see the very strong concentration towards large stellar masses. <clears throat> again, this is a relatively local universe, but this same type of thing can also be studied now in the, in the distant universe. Here's one, I think, particularly useful way of studying this in the distant universe. In, in this case, uh, th these authors have used a large sample of 8,000 AGNs within 1.3 million galaxies to look at the long-term average black hole accretion rate derived from X-ray data versus galaxy stellar mass at a variety of different redshifts. And you can see that st the stellar mass dependence is present at all redshifts and is very strong. Okay, Galaxies... Uh, rise in their black hole accretion rate, the black hole growth rate, by orders of magnitude, you know, factors of a thousand or ten thousand, okay, as the stellar mass increases from 10 to the 9.5 solar masses up to 10 to the 12 solar masses. And um, this, this is very useful information for that encodes how supermassive black holes grow over cosmic time. In addition to the strong stellar mass dependence, there clearly is a redshift dependence. So as you shift to higher and higher redshifts, going all the way out to redshifts of four, the, the uh, black hole accretion rate grows and grows and grows. That has interesting implications, uh, which I can talk about later. Um, I, uh, one point I want to make is about this black hole accretion rate. Why, do, why is this a useful quantity to measure? Why, is, why do we measure this average black hole accretion rate? And how is that even done? Well, here is the basic idea. Um, you remember I, I talked earlier on about one of the big challenges being this issue of AGN variability. Uh, AGNs vary on timescales of tens of years or hundreds of years, let alone on millions of year timescales that are relevant for the associated star formation processes and so on. And so... Um, an AGN's appearance, an individual AGN, may vary a great deal over time. 
And so when one conducts an X-ray survey, this is the central part of the Chandra Deep Field South, uh, the deepest X-ray survey that we've ever done, uh, you know, you have all of these point sources which indicate growing supermassive black holes primarily in the distant universe. But you have to ask the question, um, you know, what would this image look like if I came back in a million years or 10 million years or 100 million years and, and made another such image? Is this... In, you know, would you have the same pattern of spots on the sky? We think almost surely not due to the expected variability. So instead, you have to utilize surveys like these as a kind of statistical sampling of the types of galaxies that are growing their supermassive black holes. So then what you do to derive um, plots like this, where again, I'm showing here the estimate of a long-term time average black hole accretion rate. How is that derived? Well, what you do is you take samples of galaxies, samples of galaxies, say, with a certain range of stellar masses and, with, and at a certain redshift, and you then measure the total black hole accretion rate among that overall population of galaxies. You average over samples, utilizing the direct detections as well as stacking, uh, for example, of the non-detected sources, or there are other appropriate statistical techniques to utilize. And essentially, you're assuming black hole growth is, is ergodic, so that you can replace a sample average with a time average, and that's how we get at the long-term time average black hole accretion rate for different galaxy populations. And if you have a big enough sample, you can break that down as a function of mass in many different redshift bins and derive pretty good constraints. And, and that's what's been done in this specific work. Okay, so the stellar mass dependence is the strongest dependence in general in the local universe and over all of cosmic time, or at least 90% of cosmic time that can be measured in this work, for example. And again, this is a orders of magnitude strong dependence, as you can see. Um, now, once you have that out of the way, you have, can then look for other dependencies, although you have to always be controlling for the strong stellar mass dependence. So here's a useful plot from Heckman and Best that shows uh, stellar mass versus, in this case, the specific star formation rate. So that's the star formation rate divided by the galaxy's mass. And um, in this case, Again, this is for the relatively local universe, but you can see here they break down AGNs into the radiative mode population. I talked about the radiative mode versus the jet mode in the lecture on uh, jets and radio loud AGNs, so please go back and refer to that if necessary. But here you have radiative mode AGNs. These are the uh, efficiently accreting systems, and you see they are generally clustered among the overall galaxy population, more toward the star forming region, but extending down to lower specific star formation rates. Whereas the jet mode systems are much more concentrated at, um, well, low specific star formation rates, sort of red sequence galaxies. And, um, and of course, these systems have low Eddington ratio. So the AGM population is complex, and radiative mode AGNs versus jet mode AGNs lie in different places in terms of their galaxy properties, and all of this has been quantified in detail in papers and reviews such as this one. Okay, um, a few more points on star formation rate. Um, you can also uh, look in the nearby universe at the star formation rate dependence uh, with black hole accretion. Um, both for the nuclear star formation rate and for the total star formation rate of a galaxy. And basically, th these are plots that show estimates based on various tracers of the total black hole uh, accretion rate here, solar masses per year, versus the star formation rate um, for the nuclear region. Again, this can be done for nearby galaxies where this can be done in detail. And, and you can see that there is a quite good correlation, has some scatter, but it's not too bad, spanning orders of magnitude again between the uh, black hole accretion rate and the nuclear star formation rate. However, when you look at the galaxy's total star formation rate, that same correlation is still present, but there's much, much more scatter to it, as you might physically expect, because here you're looking at parts of a galaxy that are far um, separated from the supermassive black hole region, where here you're studying the more immediate vicinity of, of the supermassive black hole. Um, now, this, of course, uh, will present a fundamental challenge for distant universe studies, because for distant universe studies, well, you don't have the luxury 
<coughs> in general of being able to go in and measure just the nuclear star formation rate to get a relation like this, you have to deal generally with total star formation rates where there's going to be a lot of scatter, as you can see here. And this is a fundamental challenge. Um, but nevertheless, people have studied the uh, star formation rate of um, AGNs uh, um, in different uh, stellar mass galaxies, for example, or in different AGN uh, X-ray luminosities. And um, in this case, what is being plotted is the so-called normalized star formation rate. This is the star formation rate uh, for AGNs versus the star formation rate expected from the galaxy main sequence that I've talked about earlier. And you can see the normalized star formation rate, according to this work, uh, appears to be higher um, for relatively low mass galaxies uh, with AGNs. And, and, and in this case, they look in different stellar mass bins and they find luminosity correlations um, where the, the um, again, this, this star formation rate appears to be higher in more luminous AGNs and somewhat lower and less luminous AGNs. And, and these papers and others have defined these various correlations. And I refer you to these papers uh, to, to learn more, but, but please always remember that, that these are very challenging works because you are dealing here with the star formation rate of the entire galaxy, and you're comparing that to the growth rate of the supermassive black hole just in the very central part of the galaxy, so you're dealing with lots of scatter present, and that's inherent and leads to you know some of the large uncertainties that are present in these studies. Um, here's another uh, nice example. In this case, uh, the, in this case uh, the authors looked at the black hole accretion rate as a function of stellar mass. Again, this being a very useful quantity for the reasons I've described um, for star forming systems and quiescent systems. And you at many different redshifts running all the way from redshifts of 0.1 out to redshifts of 4, it seems pretty clear that in general, the black hole accretion rate is larger in star forming galaxies than it is in quiescent systems over all of cosmic time as best we can measure it. Um, that's another interesting result with star formation. And, and then I will also just mention that there are interesting correlations with stellar ages. Here is a, a local universe study that uses the 4000 angstrom break uh, from spectroscopy to quantify stellar ages. And all galaxies in the local universe follow this overall pattern. AGNs, as expected, preferentially inhabit the massive systems, but you can see at a fixed mass, the, the AGNs have, um, well, they have much younger mean stellar ages, again, being derived from this 4,000 angstrom break, because you can see up at the high masses, uh, normal galaxies are up here where the AGNs are displaced clearly to lower uh, mean stellar ages. And so there is a stellar age dependence as well present, which is very interesting. And broadly similar results have now been found using the 4000 angstrom break and other techniques up at high redshift as well. Um, and then uh, other interesting relations are found uh, relying upon morphology. In this case, um, Hubble Space Telescope imaging has been used to measure the so-called compactness of uh, galaxies. Uh, compactness is a basic measure of the kind of mass to size ratio of galaxies. In this case, there's a variety of different ways compactness is defined. In this case, uh, this quantity sigma 1 is the stellar mass within one kiloparsec uh, averaged over that, that physical size. So it's kind of like the, the stellar mass density over the inner kiloparsec. And what this physically corresponds to is kind of shown down here with imaging, whereas you go from low compactness systems over here to high compactness systems over here, you can see that the, the, the mass to size ratio is um, becoming larger and larger. Okay, um, And furthermore, at least for gas rich star forming galaxies, this sigma one quantity may and should also serve as a tracer of the central gas density on a kiloparsec scale. And so uh, authors have looked for and indeed now have found correlations between black hole accretion rate and compactness for star forming galaxies. Here is that long term average black hole accretion rate plotted as a function of galaxy compactness in three different redshift bins derived from Cosmos and the candle surveys uh, running all the way from redshifts of 0 to 0 0.8 up to 1.5 to 3. 
And um, you see that there are clear correlations between black hole accretion rate and compactness indicating this is another driver of supermassive black hole growth. And this, this driver is not just merely a secondarily induced correlation as I warned about earlier. Partial correlation testing uh, demonstrates that. Uh, also notably, um, this cor these correlations with compactness are really not seen so well for quiescent galaxies. You see them primarily for the star forming galaxies, suggesting that indeed uh, the central gas density is being traced, and that is playing a significant role in driving the supermassive black hole growth. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, the, the redshift dependence here can be understood in that overall picture via the evolution in cold gas density uh, rising as you go to higher redshifts. Okay, so that's the compactness dependence. And, and then finally, um, well, here I show the, the very famous well-known correlations between supermassive black hole masses and bulge properties. And it's quite remarkable that these correlations exist at all, given all the chaos that we've talked about um, you know, earlier on in this lecture, all the various physical processes operating, how complex they are, how they play off against each other. Nevertheless, out of all those, all that complexity, all that chaos, order emerges such that the supermassive black hole's mass and the galaxy's bulge mass and also the galaxy's bulge velocity dispersion are quite tightly correlated over large physical ranges. And again, this is a remarkable correlation because the black hole size compared to the size of the bulge is comparable to a pebble compared to the size of the Earth. Yet these quantities remain physically correlated, which is quite remarkable. Um, and remember that the black hole mass is tightly correlated with the bulge stellar mass, but is not tightly related to total, the total mass of a galaxy or to the disk mass. There are correlations there, but they're not nearly as tight as these. And you can look at some of the references I cited for, for details of that. Um, <clears throat> but somehow order has emerged from chaos. So Egg Shen would be happy about that. And um, how could that happen? Or can we see evidence of, of this? Can we see evidence of uh, feeding of supermassive black holes that would lead to this relation or that would at least maintain this relation? And, and the answer seems to be, yes, we can. Um, th that is done <clears throat> by essentially measuring the time derivative of this diagram. Of course, the time derivative of the black hole's mass is the black hole accretion rate, which can be measured from the X-ray data as a long-term average via the techniques I talked about. And the uh, galaxy bulge mass time derivative, well, that will be the galaxy bulge star formation rate. And so um, Yang et al. have looked at the correlations for bulge-dominated galaxies. So we deal with galaxies where essentially the galaxy is dominated by the bulge, so other stellar components hopefully don't cause much of a problem. And you plot black hole accretion rate measured from the X-ray data versus star formation rate for the bulge because the bulge dominates the system. And you find there are quite clear correlations at redshifts of 0, 0 0.5 to 1.5 and 1.5 to 3 between black hole accretion rate and star formation rate. Uh, for comparison, in galaxies that are not bulge dominated, there may be a bit of a correlation, but it's much less clear, likely due to other stellar components being substantially present in the system and ruining uh, the correlation. Moreover, you can quantitatively fit this correlation. This is the fitting result. And you find that the black hole accretion rate to the star formation rate for bulge dominated galaxies is about one part in 302 from this fit, from that logarithmic offset, which is not too far off from the sort of typical black hole mass to bulge mass locally. So, <clears throat> this is taken as indeed evidence for true coevolution, since uh, in this case, uh, apparent um, lockstep growth of supermassive black holes and bulges is being observed. And further investigations indicates that this correlation as seen in these data specifically, uh, likely is able to maintain 
uh, the black hole mass versus bulge stellar mass relation, but likely does not create it. Other processes, perhaps at even higher redshifts or even among more luminous systems, probably must be responsible for creating it. But it's interesting to see that you can make some headway in understanding the origin of this relation, or at least the maintenance of this relation, via direct measurements of black hole growth, you know, how the monster is being fed, and that how that corresponds to the star formation rate of the bulge. Um, and then finally, another way to address this same issue is just to try to measure supermassive black hole masses out at higher redshifts. This is very challenging to do, but it has now been done, for example, with reverberation mapping in this study. And here are, again, local measurements of uh, black hole masses. And here they're plotting the sort of delta log MH versus the locally measured value. Um, and <clears throat> you can see here compared to the bulge, um, there doesn't seem to be much evolution of delta log black hole mass as you go out to higher redshifts, uh, considering reverberation map systems and then considering a variety of other studies that have attempted to measure uh, black hole masses out at higher redshifts. So again, this these are these are local reverberation map systems here. These are reverberation map systems from a higher redshift uh, project, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey Reverberation Mapping Project. And then here are other sort of generally single epoch measures of, of, of black hole masses. And there doesn't seem to be strong evolution compared to the local relation, which again is shown by the dashed line in the gray shaded region there. And here is a similar relation for host galaxies down there. There doesn't seem to be much of a correlation. So that's what uh, one can say very briefly about um, the feeding of supermassive black hole monsters. Uh, there's much more that can be said. And again, I refer you to those reviews and to uh, the proceedings or the slides from those conferences uh, that I've mentioned uh, for, for more information. Thank you.